Choosing between a full screen edition and a wide screen edition of a movie can sometimes be confusing. Aspect ratios can get even the most avid movie buff momentarily confused when terms like 4x3, pan and scan, 235, and cropped are casually thrown about. The Incredibles was filmed in a panoramic widescreen format also known as scope. The widescreen edition of a movie presents the film frame as it is seen in the movie theater. Since a movie screen is a wide rectangle and a television screen is more like a square in shape, the movie image has to be reduced and sandwiched between two black bars to fill up the space because you can't fit a rectangle into a square and fill it. This is also referred to as the letterbox format. Now, a full screen edition of the movie does away with the black bars, and instead it fills your television from the top to bottom with images. However, since it's impossible to cram a rectangle into a square, the sides of the film frame have to be chopped off or cropped. You're only seeing a portion of the entire image. I grant you that. But at, at least that image fills up your television screen. That's what the disclaimer, this film has been formatted to fit your TV means. But we work very hard on our images, and as filmmakers, we much prefer our home audiences to watch the widescreen version as it shows the entire screen. We're proud to present The Incredibles as it was meant to be seen. After you've watched The Incredibles, check out all the great bonus material on disc two. There's an original animated short, Jack-Jack Attack, as well as scenes deleted from the story reels and great documentary material so that you can get an idea of the nightmare it was to make this film. I'm just kidding. Okay. So on behalf of the Incredibles team, dim the lights, crank up the sound, and enjoy. That if we had the usual Randy Newman music coming out of Bounden, that we were not changing as we wanted to. And uh, uh, Michael, I think, hit it right on the head. And how great to see such a wildly different uh, short film in front of The Incredibles, both coming out of the same studio. Right. Different sensibilities, one, one studio. <laughs> one brand name. Do you have a secret identity? Every superhero has a secret identity. I don't this opening, um, I wanted to begin the film with uh, something that was unexpected. And, you know, most superhero movies begin with the big whammo blammo thing. And I thought uh, if we started in this kind of uh, strange, you know, the film's kind of beat up and old and we're looking at them in some kind of personal uh, a documentary sense that it would put the emphasis on them being people. So they're superheroes, but you're seeing them being decidedly unsuper here. They're just sitting around talking about being super. And I thought that that was already subverting the patients. And the interesting thing, or the thing I was going for anyway, was the fact that they are talking about things that they think their future will involve. So Frozone is the ladies' man, even though we later see him as being married. Bob is talking about settling down, although later he has a problem with it. And Helen is can't imagine settling down, and she turns out to make the transition very well. So that's a little comment about what we think our future is going to be versus what it is. And, and at one time we had uh, Buddy Pine in there. That's yeah, right, right, and we cut him because it... Uh, giving away something. Right. So now we are into the whammo blammo. So the idea here was that once everybody had settled down to this documentary thing, you hit them with a left and uh, launch them into outer space. Right, and then the aspect ratio goes from 133 to 239 and Suddenly the image clears up, up and no the more sound gets big. Great, it's, you don't have the sound coming out of the one mono channel. This was showing the golden days. So uh, Janet LaCroix, uh, who directed the lighting photography on all of this stuff, we talked about uh, with Lou Romano about having this be more saturated in color and golden in hue to give the idea that everything was at its best in this time. And this is more comic booky kind of staging, you know, bigger and everything's kind of broader and the colors are broader and the poses are bigger and everything's kind of the, the superheroes the way we're used to seeing them. And we certainly labored over the design of the Incredible, which you only see in this uh, in this sequence. But right. They did a great job on it. The amount of cheats to convert the car are relatively few, which is sort of amazing. Yeah. Because uh, the car really does kind of change shape. So we do all this work, and then 
it goes by it's in like gone. two seconds and you just kind of go, uh, can we create another five sequences <laughs> where the car converts right, right, right. to get our money's worth? But um, I think that's the aspect of these films that is, is delightful is, is there is enough detail in them uh, that they can stand up to multiple viewings. And uh, certainly Pixar is well known for going the extra mile for um, the amount of detail and That's nuance. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we'd, we'd always joked about it. It would be great to have the incredible uh, scene later in the movie with uh, a baby seat in the back with Jack-Jack you know, going <laughs> go, go yeah. to the grocery store. You know? <laughs> Some, somehow he managed to hold on to it. Yeah, yeah. 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 He had yeah. it in the back, you know, just covered up. <laughs> yeah, in fact, Teddy Newton, who did uh, character designs with Tony Fucilli for the film, did a fantastic drawing in the earliest days of all the family in, or, or actually they were flying. Uh, oh, right. Everyone was fl- that in my earliest version of The Incredibles. Everyone could fly except Bob, <laughs> and, and it, it was a kind of a sore point with him. And uh, <laughs> uh, Teddy did this fantastic drawing of all the the family flying, and then Bob like underneath them in a car in, in a, a station, station wagon, wagon. <laughs> yeah. with his arm out with the his window, arm out, the way, yeah. you know the fist up, you know, yeah, was, to the rescue, to the rescue. Said, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I had that. I had that drawing. Pasted to my door for the entire four years of the movie to the rescue, you know, because right. I always felt like Bob in the uh, <laughs> in the station wagon with everybody flying yeah. above me. Thank you will suffice. Thanks, but I don't need any help. Whatever happened to ladies first? Well, whatever happened to equal treatment? Hey, look, wait, the lady got me first. Oh. Well, we could share, you know. I work alone. Well, I think you need to be more. So right here, we're watching some, uh, I think, extraordinarily good animation by uh, Dave Mullins and uh, Korea Yoku on uh, Elastigirl and uh, some wonderful stuff on Bob. Everybody kind of pitched into this stuff, so I'll never be able to keep up with it. Now you just stay here. They usually pick up the garbage in an hour. Beautiful ice effects by Ma Kobayashi, Kobayashi here. Yeah. Under Sandy Cartman's supervision and beautifully designed by Ralph Eggleston the art director. And uh, here's some fantastic animation by Carlos Baena. For some reason, the animators from Spain, we have two of them on this film, <laughs> and they shared a room. They could do the most extraordinarily fantastic physical stuff. I mean, it's nuanced, it's caricatured, it feels weighty and physical, and it just, uh, you know, I got to the point where if I had something that was really hard to do, Physically, I'd go, we must go to Spain, <laughs> you know, go to the Spaniards. <laughs> Here's our character, uh, Bom Voyage, who at one point was named... Uh, Bomb Perignon. <laughs> the uh, Dom Perignon people didn't they think didn't that was too that. good of an idea, so we had to change him. <laughs> Dominique Louis, who is a wonderful production designer here at Pixar, provided the voice for uh, Bomb Voyage. And Jason Lee is doing the voice for Buddy Pine, who also does the voice for Syndrome, so he's playing himself. 15, 20 years younger. Yeah, we were worried that he wouldn't be, uh, we would have to use a kid. And we thought it would be better if we could get Jason to sound like a kid because oftentimes they sound like different people. They right. don't sound like the same person. So we had to do some experimentation, both with having Jason raise his voice a little bit and change the speed and the way he says things, and then also pitching it up slightly in Pro Tools. And we found this blend of the two that worked very well. There's a lot of wonderful animation here uh, by Andrew Gordon and Travis and all kinds of people getting in the flavor of this comic book moment where everything is kind of, you know, the guys face each other and they say, Bon voyage! And, Monsieur Incroyable! But it's all meant to be done broadly. And yet not in a way that mocks it. It's a fine line we're trying to tread here, but we don't want to do this in a campy way. We want to say that we believe in this world, but also kind of enjoy that it's really kind of absurd. Yeah. So here I have this little shot that I, I had in from the very first pitch, and it's the kind of thing you normally don't see in a superhero film. 
There's a very quick shot. You'd have to go back there, home viewers. Bob kind of winces before the train hits him. And it's him preparing for the fact that this is going to hurt a little bit. It's not going to kill him. But it's, but it's a train. It's a train. <laughs> it's moving it's, fast. It's going to hurt. Yeah. So I just thought that's the kind of moment that we tried to get in, in this movie a lot. Part of my original feeling for this film was that we would always have those moments where superheroes have feelings too. That's right, and it hurts. Bon voyage. Any other night I'd go after him myself, but I've really got to go. But don't worry! Check out the lighting in this. Isn't this great? Yeah, it's great. Just yeah. great. Uh, Janet LaCroix and company did a fantastic job. And there's a beautiful job. exterior of a church that you never see again. <laughs> right. Yeah, you got to realize that for John and I here, this has been a like, you know, a four-year journey and we're we're blasting through these four years because things that we had meetings over and fought over and here's uh, oh, the reverend the reverend uh, excellently the, voiced by by um, our producer john walker <laughs> that's right right let's go back and listen to him again <laughs> there are nuances <laughs> aplenty there unbelievable we watch these things and all of these battles and struggles that we had go by in in an instant and it's like watching your kids grow up or that's something right, like yeah. that before your eyes. Announce this couple, husband and wife. As long as we both shall live. Very sort of romantic lighting, and it's kind of meant to, to emphasize the harshness of what's coming now, where the images are jittery and blown out and uh, very gritty and grainy, and, and uh, it's meant to be a uh, sudden jolt. But unlike the opening, we're in full aperture ratio. So it's like we're looking at 133 old Academy footage, but we've zoomed in on it. So the grain is bigger and, and it, it's got that old overcooked, you know, dragged behind a car feel. Five days later, another suit was filed by the victims of the L train accident. Incredibles court. And I love this use of, uh, you know, courtroom sketches, sketches. in there. As well as Teddy Newton, who's uh, the fabulous narrator voice here. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Our um, character designer and overall uh, crazy genius. That's right. Uh, Teddy Newton does the narrator. For some reason, he has a knack for doing these old uh, movie voice guys. Uh, yeah, and, sort of industrial film-esque. Yeah, kind of, you know, news on the march guy. <laughs> the courtroom sketches were done by Peter Soane. Pete Soane, yeah. Who's an excellent guy that worked with us, uh, as did Teddy on Iron Giant. And a shot that drove us crazy with all of these miscellaneous human Humans, characters. and the thing is, is you won't even know because if you do them right, nobody notices, notices them. them right? just, it was just hard to do them so that no one would notice them. <laughs> right. I don't understand. I have full coverage. I'm sorry, Mrs. Hoganson, but our liability... Here we cut to Bob's current life, and I wanted to take a very different... Uh, the way this stuff was presented. I talked with Lou and Janet about desaturating all the color here, so it's almost like we've dialed down all the color that we saw in the prologue. It's kind of lost a lot of its life. It's kind of governed by Bob's feelings. The home has a little more color than the InsuraCare stuff. And the other interesting thing that we did here that I think worked out well is I actually pushed the camera back uh, in 3D space and zoomed in on this stuff so that it was flat. If you pull the camera back in space and then zoom in on things, the dimension gets lost and everything compresses and feels claustrophobic. So all of these shots are compressed and they make the world feel tighter and flatter. And, and uh, the idea is to not move the camera very much when, when you get into insurer right. care right. Um, and have everything feel compressed and claustrophobic. But there's nothing I can do. Oh, thank you, man. I'm sorry, ma'am. I know. And Jean Sincere was playing Mrs. Hoganson. <laughs> Here's Wally Shawn as Gilbert Huff. <laughs> yeah. It was a, kind of a strange thing on the movie was the very first voices that we recorded were all writers. Uh, Wally yeah. Shawn is a playwright, a really a great playwright, and uh, Sarah Val is a, a wonderful author and essayist and they did our first voices right. morning break is over morning break is over 
Bernie Dash's teacher is voiced by Lou Romano, who is our production, production designer. designer. And uh, this was a sequence that was kind of in and out. In and, and out, in and out. I mean, because the movie was it's 107 minutes, and it was the longest movie that Pixar has ever made. And this was a sequence that we really talked about just not doing to get the time down and to save money, essentially. But we're, we decided it, in the end that it was... It never played you know, as well played without, without it. It. Yeah. it was kind of important to see everybody's normal life before you started getting outrageous with it right, and seeing that it caused problems. It became too much of a story about Bob. And at the beginning of the movie, you didn't see the rest of the family enough if you cut this sequence and the one uh, following it, which is Violet's introduction. Right. And that was a note from John Lester, our executive producer, who said, leave him in. John is very good about making decisions based on what works. And even though we were uh, running a little bit long, he saw the value of keeping the sequence. So he came in to the defense of it. And I thought that was good. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it just meant a little more work. <laughs> <laughs> I was glad to see it back, though. Yeah. <laughs> Dash, this is the third time this year you've been sent to the office. We this is a uh, very subdued sort of scene, setting up that there's uh, problems in the family that go with having these powers and never being able to use them. And the goal on this stuff was to show that Helen's trying to be a good mom by sticking to the rule book, but she herself doesn't really believe the stuff that she's saying. These kind of scenes are challenging in their own way for an animator because they're not particularly physical. They're confined scenes, and, and it's all about expressions and timing and keeping things uh, animated but not making them too big. You're saying no one is. Here's our heartthrob. Tony Reidinger, who's been through a few designs. <laughs> yeah. Tony almost almost uh, made it into the film in a different in incarnation, but at the, right. at the last moment we decided he wasn't, he wasn't uh, heartthrobby enough, and he got a last-minute redesign. Yeah, yeah, I think the problem was these characters are very hard to build. They take a lot of time. They are like instruments that, that the animators are going to play. So they have to be capable. It's like building a car for a race driver or something, uh, or a Stradivarius for a musician. And it takes a long time to um, build. So we put all of our juice on our main characters, and there was c kind of a gulf between our main characters and our secondary characters. and. We kind of had to just bite our lip and be okay with it, and I was ready to be okay with it. And fortunately, again, our executive producer, John Lasseter, pulled the little stop the train break uh, very late in the film, almost at the last minute, and said, we got to make these better. And everybody was really happy that he did, because if John, if John says <laughs> fix it, then everybody can just go, hey, he says fix it. You know, of course, we all wanted to fix it, but we, you know, we were running out of time and money, and, and uh, it was wonderful that John made the choice to to get that uh, picked up because made it a makes, huge difference. makes a huge difference and makes it all feel like one world. I'm making weird faces again? No, I'm not. You make weird faces, honey. Do you have to read at the table? Uh -huh. Yeah. Smaller bike. So here is the um, family life, and um, Lou and Janet and I talked about warming things up a little bit because even though it's in. Bob's a little more claustrophobic part of the movie. Home is not a bad place. It's a nice place. Um, and he's just really not not engaging as much as he needs to. Put attack on the teacher's chair. During. This has got a, a lot of uh, wonderful opportunities for character stuff. And it reminds me of a million dinners that I was in when I was sort of Dash's age. And uh, we used to have these very sort of crazy dinners with my family and and now that I'm a father you know uh, dinner is still a place where you kind of collect uh, all the characters in the house and let them bounce off each other you know around this little square and so it's a wonderful opportunity to set up 
the family part of this film. It is leftover night. We have steak, pasta. What are you hungry for? Tony Reidinger. Shut up. Well, you are. I said shut up, you little insect. Well, she is. Do not shout at the table. Believe it or not, one of the hardest things to do in this scene was keeping track of all the stuff on the table. On the table. It was just a nightmare, uh, you know. You know, and you have these meetings where they're going like, <laughs> oh, the, broccoli the broccoli is, is the moved. Place. <laughs> well, the broccoli, there's no continuity on the broccoli or the... The, the gravy. Yeah, there was this thing that Nigel said at one point where everybody's at each other's throats, you know, everybody's sick of digital food, you know, and uh, people are starting to yell a little bit at each other and, and Nigel kind of raises voices. Can, can we please get back to the issue of the gravy? gravy. <laughs> back to him with that one going, uh, please, can we get back to the issue of the gravy? But there was meat juice and gravy and what about the peas and where's the broccoli is moving and, and it's, it's gone it's, it was there where did it go well uh, clearly the broccoli <laughs> is next to dad and this angle and and then finally it's just like oh forget it they're, they're, nobody's they're, gonna who care cares? Throw, just yeah. throw it around doesn't matter where it is well we worked <laughs> yeah. somewhat yeah. to get it you know we got it to the point where you shouldn't notice it if you're a normal human being that's right um, but you can if you want to you if can you probably want find to, some inconsistencies you can find food <laughs> continuity <laughs> problems in this film. <laughs> hey, we'll do. Uh, good night, Helen. Good night, kids. Don't think you've avoided talking about your trip to the principal's office, young man. Uh, you know, I would love to just stop at every instance and give each animator who did these scenes their proper due. In the first stuff that we did, and this is among the first stuff that we yeah. did. Um, the film was broken up a little more, though, to give everybody something to do. So it's changing from animator to animator somewhat quickly. Um, Eli Fucilli uh, also did the voice of Jack-Jack right there, did this laugh, and we loved it so much that I, I wanted it to be in the movie. And he's the little son of one of our supervisors, supervising animator Tony Fucilli. Define covering. What does Baron Von Ruthless do? He starts monologuing. He starts monologuing. Anyway... I would love to stop at every instance and point up, uh, uh, in fact, right here is wonderful animation by uh, Mike Venturini and Mike Wu, Wu Dog. Uh, Mike <laughs> Venturini did Frozone and Wu Dog did uh, Bob in the scene. And this is, a, this is a very atypical scene for animation. You don't get too many times a scene of two guys sitting in a car talking. And yet, if I were an animator, I would love to animate these scenes. And I tried to write something that would be interesting to animate. I think this is wonderfully contained animation. I think they hit it out of the park. I love this stuff. And beautiful lighting, too. People think of animation only doing things where people are dancing around and doing right. a lot of histrionics, but animation is not a genre. And people keep saying, the animation genre. It's not a genre. A Western is a genre. Animation is an art form. And it can do any genre. You know, it could do a detective film, a cowboy film, a horror film, an R-rated film, or a kid's fairy tale. But it doesn't do one thing. And next time I hear, oh, what's it like working in the animation genre? I'm going to punch that person. <laughs> And you're using depth of field, which you use all the way through the movie, moving, you know, foreground uh, characters out of focus. And, yeah, and um, you know, a lot of people, when they do CG, want to take advantage of the fact that there's no light issues in CG in terms of depth of field. You can make everything deep focus like Citizen Kane. So a lot of people go, well, you can have infinite depth of field. Why would you want it otherwise? Well, I, I could see that for certain projects. Certainly it works fantastically well in Citizen Kane. But in this film, um, I, I wanted to use the focal length to focus you on, on what to look at. Other Pixar films have varied the focal length too. So it's, it's not like I'm saying that we're inventing it on this. I'm just saying that oftentimes it makes things uh, a little trickier to do because you're having to constantly pull the focus around like an action-filled live-action film. But to me, when you're dealing out this much information and the film is is got a lot of fast-moving scenes in it, it's one more tool you can use to direct the audience's eye. And so I wanted it in, in a lot of scenes. 
And you used it a lot. I, mean, did I did, yeah. and it was a pain in the butt yeah. because you were constantly having to send <laughs> scenes back to get the focal length right. Well, all right, right here is one. You yeah, know? sure. We pull the focal length on uh, Frozone there. Now, I want I you know, to... I know. There's a great effect. Free. Yeah. Mark Andrews, who did uh, supervised all the storyboarding of the film, this was an idea that they had that they kind of had to sell me on. You know, I was like, oh, come on, a bullet's not going to freeze in space, <laughs> you know, come on, the amount of, you know, they were like, come on, no, it'll be cool. And they saw that I was kind of, you know, there was a crack definitely open in the door, and I, I folded. So you made the copsicle. Yeah, the copsicle, <laughs> yes. <laughs> No, no, I, w I had the idea of yeah. freezing the cop. Yeah. I just didn't have the idea of the bullet, the bullet frozen yeah. in space. And that was the one they had to sell me on. I, l I love that he hums his own theme music here. Yeah, we, he yeah <laughs> Craig did a great job on that, too. This is one of my favorite scenes in the movie. Mine, too. I think that Holly and Craig did a great job on the voices. I think that it's extraordinarily well animated. It starts out as Ron Zorman um, eating the cake, and then it turns into Dave Mullins for Helen Busting Bob. Then it's Andy Schmidt when they start to really argue, and then it's John Cars. Each one of them were, were given pretty long runs once the argument starts so that they could control both characters throughout the scene. That's a great scene. And this was um, a little bit, in the early days, a tough sell to Pixar because this was one of the first scenes that we did in storyboarding. And I think Pixar thought that, you know, we were intending to make an hour-and-a-half-long Bergman movie showing <laughs> marital conflict. But uh, to everyone's credit, when they saw how it fit in with everything else, they came right around and, and, and went with this scene. This was an interesting scene to write because often when people argue, what they're really fighting about is not what they say they're fighting about. And to communicate one thing while saying another is an interesting challenge. It's psychotic. They keep creating new... I, I just think that it's really wonderful stuff. It is animated. It doesn't feel like it's simply reproducing live action. But it feels real and believable. She didn't stretch for a long time at the end of the fight, and he was too threatening to her. Yeah, people yeah, were yeah. feeling very uncomfortable yeah. with that moment. And then uh, when she said, this is not about you, because Bob is so much bigger than Elastigirl, and it felt almost like you know spousal Whoa. abuse yeah, or yeah. something like that. And uh, I thought, well, wait a minute. I don't have to change the scene. I just have to make mom. Mom is, is his equal. And so if she just uses her stretching to become physically, you know, to kind of say, uh, I will stand up to you. Right. Uh, and then, can tower over you should I choose to. Right. Yeah. It, 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 once I did <laughs> yeah. that, everyone was okay with the scene and I didn't have to change a word. Yeah, and it really is an excellent. I mean, because mom doesn't like to use her powers and, and she does it there for a great effect. Eight, one, eight, three. You will be Mr. Huff would like to talk to you in his office. Hmm. No. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Bob, you know. Yeah. He's the only guy whose cube is filled with a giant pillar. Yeah, he right. He can't fit through the door. That was an early idea that somebody came up with. Um, it it might have yeah. been Ted Blackman or somebody. I don't know whether it was Lou or... But... Uh, uh, the idea was that his, his cube is the only one with a support structure on it to make it even more Walker. confining. Yeah. I'm not happy, Bob. Not happy. So there's a little cactus over Bob's shoulder there that is in the shape of Huff. <laughs> and uh, there's great little art direction things here with Lou Romano and company where the chair kind of looks like it's frowning. The desk is kind of pointing pointed at. out at Bob. All the little pencil things are pointed in Bob's direction. Can you imagine a more uncomfortable chair than the one he's sitting in? Right. And I've been in that chair many times. And, you know, I was fired out of two of my first three jobs. So I relate to this stuff, you know, where this very small guy is trying to tell you about life and... <laughs> and how you don't, you don't deserve to be in it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is an abstraction of all the tiny thinking people in the world. And there are a lot of them. We've all run into them. 
And unfortunately, you know, they're often in positions of medium power. They're never in the top positions. <laughs> That's right, right. They're always in middle management. <laughs> right. But uh, I like the idea of this big superhero having to listen to this little blowhard and, and being powerless uh, when every instinct in his body tells him to get out there and, and, and mix it up. Right. Look at me when I'm talking to you, Par. That man out there. He needs help. Do not change the subject, Bob. We're just... This is some wonderful animation by Tim Hiddle. Well, let's hope we don't come... Again, I apologize to all the animators I'm not mentioning, but uh, everyone did an extraordinary job. Oh, and this is interesting. At this point, I wanted to go to wide-angle lenses. The minute that Bob started to move uh, and, and be active again, I got the lenses away from being flat, and I started moving the camera a little bit because I wanted to get a, just a taste of Mr. Incredible again. Right. And then we're back into the flat lenses and, and the symmetrical compositions. I like the way the little files bounce when he hits them. <laughs> um, there was a little Tony Fucilli animation there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Of uh, Bob grabbing Huff, he yeah. Tony. I want that scene. I think t <laughs> Tony was working out some some past issues in that scene. So here is uh, another kind of not typical scene, I think, for animation. It's just two guys walking down a hallway talking about problems. There's some good animation on the orderlies there, and that you don't normally notice. Rick Dicker here, our poor government uh, worker, is voiced by Bud Lucky, who's an old-time Pixar guy. I think uh, was one of the principal designers of Woody and Toy Story and uh, directed Bounden that is also on this uh, uh, DVD. Yeah. He did a, a wonderful temp voice, and everybody liked it so much, we just thought, well, let's use it in the film. <laughs> so it's it's Bud Lucky and, and Craig here yeah, voicing always, this thing. We always wanted uh, Rick Dicker to introduce Bounden. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We had this whole really abstract opening of uh, Rick Dicker coming into his office late at night, pulling out a bottle of booze and a, and a banjo. A banjo. <laughs> starting in on unbounded. Starting in unbounded. <laughs> and uh, I don't know why it wasn't done. Uh, yeah, I think kind it's... of a weird idea. Something yeah. amazing, I guess. Me too, kid. At this point in the story, Bob is feeling like the world is, is uh, tightening around him, and uh, he's a very defeated guy. So, uh, And boy, talk about Pixar detail in this sequence. There's a ton of it. This was our first sequence, yeah, really. Um, all of the different uh, posters and newspaper uh, clippings. Mr. Incredible and, memorabilia. And, the, right, and my favorite is Mr. Incredible Sings. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's his, like, William Shatner album. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Up on the wall there someplace. Yeah. <laughs> There's actually a really good graphic there. Yeah. On, on, uh, but, yeah, this, the walls, you could definitely linger this camera around and catch a lot of details about Bob's life. There's shots of him in Frozone at some... Uh, yeah, they, benefit or something, <laughs> yeah. you know, and they're in their superhero yeah. outfits. Hello, Mr. Incredible. There's a wonderful, subtle little effect right here. You know, I wanted to imply that this was a 3D lenticular sort of image. So Rick Sayer and a bunch of geniuses uh, here at Pixar figured out how to simulate sort of a lenticular effect. And I, you know, I almost wish we used it a little more. I wish the camera angles showed you it a little more. It is there, yeah. But uh, the camera has to move in order for you to see it. Huh? What? Dinner's ready. Okay. okay. Although it is contained within an isolated area, it threatens to cause incalculable damage. So here, I I wanted the filmmaking to be jumpy and and busy and kind of moving around a lot because I wanted it to reflect the fragmentary absorption of Bob constantly trying to pay attention to this thing get the details down and being pulled out of it by Helen who's you know wondering what's going on in there and again it's that juxtaposition which it was so important in so many scenes in this of the mundane and the fantastic I mean he's been given chance to return to his old days with this fantastic mission and at the same time mom's outside the door you know telling him that dinner's ready Here's this glorious uh, music cue for by Michael Giacchino coming around and Bob 
being able to see the possibilities of returning to his great life. Right, and, and uh, we wanted to light this with this golden light and have him really connecting with all the things that he loved about his old days and feeling like it's within his grasp again. Again, we have the mundane and the fantastic here. This thing self-destructs and starts the, all the sprinklers in the house. And, of course, the family gets the sprinklers, too. And, and <laughs> he has to deal with it. And then, you know, the aftermath of that is, you know, you got to dry everything out. With a pink hair dryer, of course. <laughs> well, yeah, because that would be Helen. Um, this is a wonderful sustained piece of character animation by Correa. She did both characters in this incredibly long shot without a cut. And um, if you, you can follow each individual character all the way through the shot here and they are absolutely as in the moment as any good live action performance, I think. You can feel them questioning things and hearing things and Bob's kind of tightening when he feels like Helen's getting suspicious and he's not sure if ideas are going to fly. And it's a wonderful piece of uh, sustained character animation. Very difficult because it's so long. She was on it for months. Yeah. And had to stay concentrating for, for months. Yeah. The Omnidroid 9000. The ride is really starting now. I mean, we're going to the island he's suited up again it's you know the movie starts to go down rails at this point some uh, great graphics here designed by mark holmes and put it up on screen by andy jimenez who's one of our directors of photography I did a lot of the previs planning uh, for the film i like it because this screen is kind of between the two guys and, and yet we're not highlighting it difficult to track although we're pretty sure it's on the southern half of the island Oh, one more thing. Obviously, it represents a significant investment. You want me to shut it down without completely destroying it? <laughs> you are Mr. Incredible. So here we are, Bob's feeling very heroic, and, and once again, the mundane <laughs> is <laughs> raising its head, yeah, right. and he's got to deal with uh, stuff all of us middle-aged guys got to deal with. <laughs> and here's uh, Elizabeth Pena as Mirage. Fantastic performance. Yeah, she has a really um, great voice, and uh, she was absolutely the first person I thought of when we were looking for somebody to do this character. One of the biggest problems on this film was the problem of scale. For some reason, the computer, it seems to me, wants to make everything look small, and so we had to think things through in order to get it to things to look as big as they were supposed to be on screen. I often felt that the computer had an agenda, almost like HAL 9000 in 2001, <laughs> you know. And, and the agenda was it wanted everything to be small, weightless, plastic, rigid, and clean. And we had a whole movie where we needed things to be big, heavy, Lots of textures, pliable and dirty. So we were fighting it every step of the way. And it was like, Dave, Dave, <laughs> I, I, wanna want, make it clean. I want things to be small and weightless, Dave. You're endangering the mission, Dave. I don't think you know how to direct this movie, Dave. <laughs> Nigel and everybody did a fantastic job dressing all this jungle stuff. I yeah, mean, Tom Miller. Did Tom Miller, yeah, was our king of the jungle. King of the jungle. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. and uh, you know we had all this incredible amount of detail here, and all these leaves and things that were designed. I mean, they didn't just happen. The idea is to show that this thing is threatening here, but that Bob has actually still got a lot of his chops, and. Uh, it sets up that this world is threatening and he can get hurt a little bit. We're doing a lot of stuff very quickly here. Right. And there's a lot of really terrific animation. And I remember you talking about Bob sneaking around in this and in the subsequent scene where he sneaks into the base. The movies don't have people sneaking around in them anymore. That's right. I want I some sneaking around in my movie. Yeah. <laughs> I think that people are in such a rush to get 
the action sequences go in fast that they um, forget that there's pleasure to be had in the sneaking around part. Right, and taking a look at where you are. Yeah, so I have a few sneaking around sequences in yeah. here, and I don't think they're a waste of time. Once he jumps off the cliff there at the, you know, about 20 seconds before this, it goes to Angus McLean, who animated both the Omnidroid and Bob uh, for this whole section. And there's some wonderful effects animation. And, but uh, this is really kind of a big, long, involved piece of animation. And, and Angus took it all on himself, which is pretty amazing because it's, uh, it's a lot of stuff. And you've got your classic fantastic and mundane. In the middle of the big action fight, he blows his back out. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and the climax is the chiropractic move that puts it back together. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I, I had that gag in from as long as I was pitching the movie. I pitched that gag as part of my original pitch. And the reason I would stop for a detail like that is to try to keep reinforcing the idea that it's the mundane and the fantastic. There are a few of them that, that were all part of the original pitch that showed up in the movie. And normally in a pitch you're only doing the broad strokes, but um, every once in a while I would stop to, to point out a detail because I felt like it was important to know the tone that I was going for. There also, I think, is wonderful lighting and all of this stuff, and, and Lou did a wonderful job of orchestrating uh, it going from sunlight down into the lava, you know, and in into this dining room. And, and uh, Lou and Janet and I uh, uh, really talked about uh, how the color moves from one thing to another. And holy smokes, we go to a lot of different places in this movie. It's just one new set after another and some of them you, you just never see again and it's it's it was really challenging to get all of right these things uh, when made. we were first talking about it people were kind of freaking out I mean people were saying that uh, there were some people here that were saying that it was impossible and uh, you know fortunately for us there was also a number of people who said we can do that but it ain't gonna be easy <laughs> right. and uh, I think that we were able to to pull it off without um, breaking the bank simply by pre-planning the daylights out of it and then not deviating very much from our plans because a lot of these uh, sets uh, don't really work if you're not in exactly the positions that we pre-planned. Yeah. There's a lot of virtual stagehands just off the edge of the frame there <laughs> holding something up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's literally like one of those back lots where just one foot to the right of the edge of the frame, it goes it into falls apart. Yeah, yeah, some cement block or something. I mean, a lot of it was just trickery and being very specific. And is this great music here? This is just it's fantastic. fantastic yeah. yeah, Michael G. Kino did a wonderful job with this score. Again, back in my earliest pitches of the movie, I played this kind of early 60s music. I had a number of little bits of things uh, that I, I played while I pitched so that people could get the flavor. I, I wanted it to have the sound that I connect with a lot of uh, action movies from the early 60s. Michael catches that flavor without uh, being limited by it. It reminds you of, of those kind of scores, but it's brand new. Yeah, it's just great. Yeah. And I think that the musicians had a wonderful time playing it. Oh, i got to mention this. This is the hardest stuff for a computer guy to do. And I know you're sitting there going, what? what's so great about that? But that little fabric thing where he works his hand through there is like one guy took oh, two, just... three months on it. And uh, could it be done at all? And I don't know. And you know, we'll have to put our best men on it. you and... got to put your hand through it? Yeah. And <laughs> is there any way he can just kind of hold it? <laughs> 
and describe uh, moving th- his hand through it? There's a hole in it. it? Can oh, we do look, it with... There's a hole. <laughs> yeah, that'll yeah. work, won't can we, we? Can we just cut to his face and hear sound of him moving his hand through it? They so wanted to avoid that shot. And I said, no, the point of the story is that he's torn his old suit and he wants to fix it. Quite well, my God, no complaints. But... You know, it, it is uh, not the same, not the same at all. I, I guarantee you there are about 15 people who, during this sequence here, all they do is watch that suit that Bob is carrying in his hand because the simulation on that has been so difficult that it's like, look at oh, that yeah. thing move, look at that thing move, man. Yeah, and now, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, and toward the end of the film, when, when all this stuff had been figured out, it was a no-brainer to approve these scenes, but all this stuff of hair and fabric... I mean, not just the stuff in his hand, but the stuff he's wearing, wearing right. the ease hair, um, the fact that her lenses are slightly blowing up her eyes uh, and making them slightly larger. There's some magnification there. All that stuff has to be engineered and figured out. And this is another big scene. <gasps> Whoa, my oh, God, did you see my that? God. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really good, and yeah. it's so good that hopefully no one we'll will notice, notice it yeah. from your side of the fence being a producer that has to pay for this stuff it's a no-win situation because if we do a fantastic Fantastic job job, nobody notices (laughs) you push too hard darling but i accept I think we're overriding a lot of good work here, and we're not talking about these great sets that Lou Romano designed along with a lot of members of the art team. This big frieze taking up that whole wall there was uh, painted by Paul Topolis, a beautiful job, and then it was displaced to look dimensional. Nice man, good with kids. These places, a big elaborate set. It's tasteful, it's Bauhausy in its in its elements, but uh, it also aggrandizes heroes. The frieze and the uh, big sculpture outside with the waterfall is all about the heroes and the gods that she wishes she was still designing for. It's it's wonderful that everything's big too because she's so small and yet her personality is big. So of course her place would be big. Right. I love the way the sound changes when they walk into this giant room. It sounds uh, cavernous. Yeah, we are. E, I only need a patch job for. Wonderful animation by uh, Andrew Gordon on E for a lot of that stuff. And Rob Russ did some animation, and uh, there's some good Bob stuff in there. Uh, yeah. Listen, I could spend the entire commentary praising people, so I, I beg my crew's forgiveness if you're not mentioned. It's impossible to. You're going from one group of talented people to the next every moment, and it, you know all of you did a great job. So I'll just say all of you and get myself off yeah, the, the hook. The hun- <laughs> hundreds of people worked on this film, you know, so it's it's yeah. Check the credits. <laughs> I thank you all. We thank you all. Short notice, but you know. Uh, Duty calls. I think the animators, uh, we really set a challenge for them in, in doing this stuff. Humans are notoriously difficult to animate because everyone knows how they move. Um, you don't simply want to reproduce reality because uh, there's nothing specific or interesting about that. Uh, but you want everything to be believable. You want to believe that these are uh, living things that have feelings and pasts some wonderful animation by Dave Devan in there of mom talking to dad and you can see all this regret on her face Hair for more mimosa mm, don't mind if i do thanks your the feeling is very different this time in the manager it's all about the sort of uh, high roller welcome back to vegas bob right. please take our excellent presidential suite here and feel free to order up anything you want. So it's all about selling the sex and, and allure of this uh, uh, island paradise. Right, and, and we have some of our most beautiful shots in this whole sequence. I mean, just gorgeous stuff. Mr. Incredible, nice suit. Thanks. Nice to be back. 
The effects guys again, uh, Sandy and her team did a wonderful job on, on the jungle waterfall here and uh, I th uh, that underwater shot where the Manta Jet comes into the bay, another one that was incredibly difficult to execute. Water is a, a very tricky thing to do in CG and again it was when we showed the number of things to people. Oh yes, we're doing water and we're in outer space and we're underwater. There's some explosions underwater. And there's and explosions <laughs> underwater and, and the fabric underwater <laughs> and, and could hair you say, and simulate hair, please. <laughs> and just the volume of stuff just knocked people over, but um, the there's proof a, is in the pudding. There's another set you see just once. That's it. So here's Helen coming to the door and she's just trying to vacuum the hallway and she kind of lets her vacuum probe into the room a little bit. Big mistake. Yeah, yeah and it's the, you hear all the schmutz and things going in there and she goes, ugh, because she's got to do the whole room now. Like where you see some dishes in the sink and you come down thinking you're going to be a good guy. It's 11 o'clock at night. Everybody's asleep. You wash the two or three things in the sink and you open the dishwasher and the dishwasher is filled with clean stuff that you now know you must unpack. And it's, it's just, ugh. So it's that no good deed goes unpunished bit. Yes it's, 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 yes, it's been a while. Listen, there's only one person Bob would trust to patch his super suit. This is some of the first animation of the women in the film that we did. Um, the Helen stuff is animated by Dave Mullins, and uh, the E stuff was animated by John Cars, and they're both great scenes. And what I like about Helen's scene is that, you know, she's completely thrown off by E. She's used to being in charge, and, and E throws her off completely. Okay, goodbye. So now Bob's back in the boardroom here and uh, is surprised to find that the agenda has been changed. <laughs> <laughs> this I didn't get the memo. <laughs> it's bigger. Ladies and gentlemen, it's too much! This is the official entrance of our Syndrome character. Right. We wanted to give him an entrance where he's absolutely in control, and Bob is kind of wondering, what the heck is going on here? Who, Who is, is this, this guy? guy yeah. Why is he wearing this costume? After you trashed the last one, I had to make some major modifications. Sure, it was difficult, but you are worth it. I mean, after all... Uh, he gets a hint here and uh, is not made comfortable by the memory. Buddy! And it's not incredible either. That ship has sailed. The idea here is to have our villain be a little bit sympathetic. The roots of this problem go back. Bob made a mistake back then, not treating the kid a little more with a little more grace. And uh, the idea that I was trying to go for here was that we don't often know how simple things, how big of an effect they can have. There are a lot of people, whole countries, who want respect, and they will pay through the nose to get it. How do you think I got rich? I invented weapons, and now I have a weapon that only I can defeat. And when I unleash it, get... <laughs> you sly dog! You got me monologuing. I can't believe it. It's cool, huh? Zero point. This is an idea that was uh, of this zero point energy that I originally wrote for an opening that we didn't use that you'll find on this DVD. And I was <laughs> just love that he loses him. <laughs> <laughs> it's again the it's mundane, like, oh yeah, yeah. So there's a fantastic water simulation here by Martin Wing. What I was going to say about uh, the zero point energy is. I had some kind of corny name for the, you know, Emoba Ray or something like that. That would have worked fine. But when I was researching it on the internet, I found that there was actually a thing called Zero Point Energy that essentially does, in many respects, what is represented here. It makes heavy things kind of weightless. Hmm. And it's something that they're actually working on, which bends my mind. Okay. 
should be. That was a very difficult thing to get right, that chronos shot. That chronos yeah, shot, yeah. See it. The idea is that you can only read it from one angle. angle. And we tried to resurrect some crabs from Nemo to crawl all over. <laughs> right. <laughs> but they, we couldn't get them. Right. The idea of, of uh, Gazer Beam skeleton being in the cave was one of our story guys, Max Brace, suggested that. I had... I had some other thing in there, and, and he suggested it. I thought that was a really great idea. We incorporated it into the film, and it ended up being a great little condensing thought. This project has completely confiscated my life, darling. Consumed me as only hero work can. My best work. Okay, here's another, I think, great two-person scene that Victor Navone animated between Helen and, and E. And it turned out so beautiful. I, I had to continue. We kind of had to send some of this stuff around a little bit. There's some great Dave Devan animation right here. But I feel like um, we all lined up in terms of how these characters move. We came to an agreement what kind of walks they should have and, and how they carry themselves. And I think it's seamless in terms of everyone always feeling consistent even when they move from animator to animator. There's some wonderful design in this lab too, I think, and very specific to E, and it's a nice contrast with the rest of her house. Yeah. There's amazing shading in here by Bryn Imagiri and fabulous lighting by Janet LaCroix and the lighting crew. It has a lot of different surfaces on it, and we're trying to have kind of a hushed mood in there. Again, it's slowing the film down to take in this location because we it says something that he has this art gallery up top, but down below and, and, and it's like all... a UL lab down, <laughs> down below. <laughs> yeah. I think it looks really cool. The character of E was an amalgam of a lot of different things, fashion designers and and the kind of equipment guys that you always saw in adventure films who were geeks who were designing the stuff for the hero. Yeah. And so I thought if you combine those two things, of the equipment guy and the design person, and this little half Japanese, half German character, uh, I thought I always had a blast writing this character. Well, and you do a pretty good job voicing her, too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. We couldn't find anybody else that could do this German... Japanese accent that you dreamed up so it was you could do it so <laughs> and you did it pretty yeah, well <laughs> I, I was I was available so, yeah yeah <laughs> you're working you're working for reasonable amounts of my, money here. my rates were rates were good were cheap and <laughs> we needed to save something now uh, the, it, it's funny it, it works out here at Pixar a lot of times we we do temp tracks of these voices uh, all the characters, and I did, you know, three or four characters in the temp trap. I had, I did Bob and Syndrome, and the idea is just to get something that's a good placeholder, so everybody kind of knows what we're going for. But some of the time, people like the voices that are in the temp reel as uh, finished voices, and uh, there's a number of people at Pixar yeah, that are yeah, in the movie. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, Kari's Pixar. voice is, right. is Brett Parker, who's one of our animators. And the Pixar players are all over yeah. this film. Men at Robert's age are often unstable, prone to weakness. What are you saying? Do you know where he is? Of course. Do you know where he is? The filmmakers I most admire recognize the value of teasing moments and milking moments. You know, if you think about a good storyteller, somebody who tells good stories in a bar, they don't blast through a story. They stop and they savor certain moments and they know which moments they can milk. And all of my favorite filmmakers have the confidence to slow down. And I, Versus, I won't name names, but a lot of successful hacks who, by having rapid fire editing all the way through, never have to deal with the issue of is anybody paying attention because they keep throwing stuff at you. And to me, there's a edge of desperation about that. And um, the kind of filmmaking I most admire takes a moment to savor things because there's so many things a movie can offer. I mean, particularly when you have a really talented crew that works on getting sets to look great and, and is putting things up there. You want a moment to take them in. It's like a good comic pauses. You know, I think that a good filmmaker slows down. Ah! 
Oh, and this is one of my favorite pieces of animation, too. Uh, <laughs> we had all sorts of stuff in there, too, where they were, when the yeah. guard was crying over his buddy who was right. down. It was like, got way, way out of, out of hand. Oh, yeah. Jim Jim Murphy did uh, Bob there, and Victor Navone did the guard who gets clocked. And Victor loved the assignment so much that he did, like, seven different versions of the guard getting hit. I mean, and it's really, I, I think it'll be on the DVD, but it's like variations of a theme it's like uh like a painter doing number seven number eight he, he collapses in grief <laughs> yeah yeah uh, and they're all hysterical yeah. when that that particular uh dailies session came up he just kept presenting them and i had my choice you know and i just said ah oh, you know we got to go with number three although number four has its fine qualities <laughs> That's right. uh this sequence features some wonderful animation by Carlos Baena. Uh, and again, you know, any kind of really hard bit of physical business, you know, you, you go to the Spaniards. <laughs> go to the Spaniards if you have an impossible thing to put on screen. And it's just really physical, and, and this rock feels really heavy, and yet Bob feels really strong. And, and that's uh, a very difficult problem for an animator. Thing. And uh, uh, this is one of my, uh, I love this set, it's so simple and feels like a big movie. <laughs> Randy uh, Tom, our sound designer, did some wonderful spacious computer sounds here. I mean, the reverberant quality of the sound is, is amazing. Bolan Boshiba did both characters here. He was a hand-drawn animator who, uh, this is his CG debut, and um, did wonderful animation of E and Helen in these very contained scenes. On a business trip, a company retreat. My records say his employment was terminated almost two months ago. These still shots of all of these superheroes were really quite difficult to do because they're completely modeled shaded characters and so you have to create a still for each one so it was very difficult to get all of these things done we just were oh my gosh how many are there well there's gamma jack and there's and their names are uh, kind of fun too here i wanted to give the feeling that helen was being drawn in closer to e so i did a technique that hitchcock invented for vertigo and a lot of filmmakers have used camera in one direction and countering it with the zoom lens attachment. The sequence where we're cutting back and forth between Helen and E and Bob in the computer room is something that I did in Iron Giant as well, uh, which is seemingly disparate things with a single event. Um, there's a part where in the Iron Giant where uh, he gets caught in the power lines and you keep cutting to mom in the house and you go, how are these things connected? And then he trips in and the power goes out. Well, here Helen presses this little button to find out where Bob is and she inadvertently exposes him to this computer system. To the goo balls. To the goo balls, which was Kevin O'Brien's idea. We knew we had to stop Bob, but Kevin came up with this wild idea of, of these goo balls, which makes perfect sense if you think of uh, stopping somebody who has strength. Uh, but uh, this was all animated by Dylan Brown, who did this whole thing of Bob getting hit with the goo balls. And it was done as one long piece of animation, and then we put in multiple cameras all over the place to get the rapid cutting, and I, I think it worked out really well. Oh. So now we're back to our mundane reality here, and E is tolerating watching one of her superheroes 
crying and just suffering through it. And I love her little incinerating garbage can there. Yeah, well, and the fact that she has toilet paper, you know, I, I wanted her to have toilet paper because she's someone who would not Never have, have Kleenex. Kleenex. There's no you crying know, at East There's no, no crying at East Place. <laughs> and uh, there's some wonderful animation here by Doug Frankel. I also love the design of E's kitchen here. A weird contradiction of, of E's character is she's very tiny, but she dominates these superheroes. The only time you see Helen really flustered is when she's dealing with E, and it's capturing the essence of somebody who's so confident that they blow over everybody. Back tonight, late. You can be in charge that long, can't you? Yeah, but why am I in charge again? Nothing. Just a little trouble with daddy. You mean dad's in trouble or dad? This is about taking care of the last minute details and uh, has some more animation that I really enjoy. Bryn Imagiri did a wonderful design of all these textures and, and things that are on the wall. The painting that's behind Helen is something that Bryn did. All the bed sheets are designed. And, and in CG, you actually have to pick out the quality of the fabric. Thanks for getting back. Ron Zorman did an extraordinary job on this scene, which goes on. And uh, Patrick Lynn and I worked out this uh, very long, involved uh, scene where the camera keeps moving around. And it has to keep catching uh, different pieces of the action because everybody's talking at once and, and kind of feels seamless. And uh, I think it's a wonderful piece of animation and a nice piece of camera work as well. And it's great to, the kids really start to come in their own in this part of the film, you know. It's like we're back to them and their powers and what they can do and what they can't. Snug, I'm calling in a solid you owe me. What do you need? A jet. What do you got that's fast? Let me think. I love this music cue yeah. <laughs> uh, that Michael did. And Helen's flying the plane, which she didn't originally. originally yeah, yeah I, I had this guy named Snug, and you, you'll be able to see that on the DVD uh, if you go elsewhere. I originally wanted there to be a price paid. You know, I wanted someone to die, and it took me a while to come around to this. Um, early on, uh, we were looking for things to streamline, and John Lasseter suggested that Helen uh, fly the plane, and I didn't want to do it because... I wanted there to be a, a price paid. I wanted someone to die, in the, you know. And Lasseter was cool, you know, he'd go, okay, you know, it's your film. But, you know, I really think it would be cool if she were the pilot. And, and finally, I just, you know, yeah, it would be better. Dang it. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> it is so, cool that she yeah, flies. Yeah. It is great that she flies, and now I can't imagine it any other way. You, sir, truly are Mr. Right here is some just fantastic uh, syndrome animation started by Doug Sweetland, who kind of laid the whole thing out and nicely finished off by Dan Nguyen and Michael Makarovich, who are two young guys. And we threw them in the deep end. Doug wasn't able to finish off the scenes, and we said to these guys, can you bring this stuff home? So Doug is such an awesome animator. They were completely frightened and intimidated, but they did it anyway, which is the true meaning of courage. <laughs> yeah, and they really did a fantastic job. So all, all three of them, kudos. It's exactly what I was going for here. I wanted it to be fun to watch and also threatening. And I think you can find a villain funny, but it, you should not find a good villain anyway to be non-threatening. And I think Syndrome walks that, that tightrope between being fun to watch, but also being a force to be reckoned with. Bob's got his special beaten hairdo on too, which was a, that was a, a lot of work to get his hair simulation to fall down like that on his head. You know, Mark Henn and his team did such an amazing job with simulation. Some people in animation think that because it's called simulation, there's no work that has to be done on it. You simply plug in a hair and whatever the animated character does, the hair reacts. Well, a lot of times the hair does not react how you need it to react, and you can't animate it. So basically, these guys have to change the virtual universe that the hair exists in. They have to affect gravity or give a little puff of wind at the right moment, and that is its own art form. 
And these guys are geniuses, and they had, did a fantastic job in this film. And they have to translate the direction. I mean, the, the director says, I'd like the hair to move over here. And they hear that, but what they have to say to themselves is, that equals Mars gravity right. and, and high uh, barometric pressure yeah. and a 40-mile-an-hour gale wind and blowing, it's blowing north, in from northeast. the northeast. Nor <laughs> at, at, a nor'easter. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And then, <laughs> but only, uh, this nor'easter can only last for point oh. Two, two seconds. seconds. Press go and <laughs> hope it works. You know, <laughs> wait, wait for th a half hour and get it back and go. Ugh, too much barometric pressure. Yeah, yes. <laughs> nine or nine are transmitting in the blind guard. Disengage. Repeat. Disengage. I really had a blast working out this sequence with uh, Mark Andrews and Kevin O'Brien and all the storyboard guys who uh, did this. We uh, really went in, and I wanted to make this a nail biter, and. Uh, you know, Andy uh, Jimenez and Patrick Lynn did some great jobs with planning all these bouncy camera moves and making it feel like it's really happening at the moment. <laughs> Holly Hunter did a great job learning the brevity, you know, the pilot lingo that uh, they use in military situations. Mark Andrews was, of course, our guy to go to for that. But she wanted to know what every single thing meant before she recorded it. And, uh, you know, we explained it to her, and, man, she invested herself 400% in it, and the animators had a tremendous challenge to match her intensity, because she was so into it. Disengage, repeat, disengage! There's some wonderful animation by John Cars here of Helen and, and Violet. Um, when you need intensity, nobody can do it better than John Cars, and... Uh, uh, I love that the plane is rocking and that they're reacting to the rocking plane here. And I, and I love this great addition of uh, Violet actually trying to do the force field because that wasn't in for the longest time. She was just, you know, this little shot there where she's trying to make it, trying to help out, but she just can't. And it really pays off in some subsequent, subsequent scenes with her. Right. This yeah. shot was one of the hardest to do in the movie. Uh, we had a million different elements and we wanted it to make it feel like it was happening simultaneously. We had Helen stretching and we had hair simulation and things blowing up. Things and blowing up. 3D clouds and, and uh, wind and oh, and, and here she becomes a shoot. Oh, let's see. That yeah. took a while. Yeah. Rob Russ did some amazing animation there of Helen converting into the parachute. This is all this is all hard. All I don't, now the parachute goes into the water, water which is so now you tough. Got, uh, you it's got to intersect the water. Air and, with, oh. and that's wet now, and people are just ready to give up. Oh, and, and by the way, we wanted to crash the plane and do it again. She's alive, so we got to <laughs> Oh, and this is animation that uh, uh, Rodrigo did. Uh, again, tough physical stuff. Go to Spain. I feel like we're just devolving into this litany of, oh, this is hard, this is yeah, hard, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. hard. Right, we'll stop doing that. Yeah. Because <laughs> the whole movie was really hard. It's just a laundry list of hard-to-do stuff. And, and uh, ultimately, you know what? The audience, you know, sh it shouldn't even think about it. Um, we're just sitting here going over it, going, oh, remember that? Oh, oh remember that? <laughs> <laughs> Release me now! I think that if anybody has any thoughts that Pixar is sitting back after having the success that it's had, I can tell you as as a relative newcomer here that this is the hardest working group of people on the planet, and and they do not ever take these films for granted. They are always trying to do you know, 150%. And I am so impressed with this crew. They took this thing that was seemingly too big and too complicated and uh, they just went directly into it. It's like flying into the eye of the hurricane. And uh, I'm very proud of everyone that worked on this movie. And, and I'm proud of the company that uh, John and Ed Catmull and Steve Jobs and uh, Sarah and everybody have... Uh, made here because yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing. a great place to make a movie. Do you expect us to swim there? I expect you to trust me. Oh, I love this shot and the music cue that goes with it. And you get to see mom as the boat. What fun this is. <laughs> I just love this. 
I also like that Vi is just <laughs> sitting there grousing. You know, she's like the sullen teen. You know, she's not going to be doing anything here. But the idea too is to plant the idea that she's haunted by the fact that she didn't come through for mom on the plane is sticking in her craw. Right. I even had a shot, and I don't know why I didn't put it in. I kind of feel like I should have had it in. I, at one time, I had a little shot at the end of this. After Mom praises Dash, you kind of show Vi looking back, kind of, you know, regretfully. And I, I think probably it would have been a good idea, but anyway, somehow it got dropped and I forgot about it. Again, I credit the effects guys and the lighting and the um, animators uh, here. Uh, Jeannie Santos did a, a lot of this animation, getting it to feel like a real ensemble scene. You heard her. Part of the reason I wanted to write this little speech for Helen to tell the kids here was that there's expectations for animation. and. You know, you make this connection with animation and superheroes, you think Saturday morning. And Saturday morning, they have these very strange shows, completely designed around conflict, and yet no one ever dies or gets really injured, or there's no consequence to it. That I think that came out of, you know, a team of psychologists determined that it was bad for children. And I think just the opposite. I think that it's better if kids realize that there's a cost and that if the hero gets injured and still has to fight, it's more dramatic and it's closer to life, you know? I wanted to say that this was a different realm. This is not one of those films where we're going to put a pillow around every experience. Mom, what happened on the plane? I'm, I'm sorry, I wanted to... Have, I'm Here's some fantastic animation by uh, Cameron Miyazaki that is incredibly subtle stuff, very difficult to do. Holly and Sarah did a great job vocally here and Cameron just absolutely nailed it these very subtle little expressions and eye darts and little hesitant blinks and you can really see stuff going on in the heads of these characters and she gets her hair behind her ear getting ready to right take on her and we role. wouldn't say we would talk about how hard it no I'm no, I'm just saying it's a great thing to see her face right yeah <laughs> You know, the simulation the, guys you know. <laughs> killed themselves. This is one of my favorite cues that Michael Cicchino did. I just love it, and it's, it's Syndrome's theme, and it's used in a couple of different ways. I also think this is a fantastic set. Scott Capel had a lot to do with uh, building this. What? Valuing life is not weakness. Again, you know, I, I keep going back to the animators. They're always the unsung heroes of these films, though. Victor Navone did a wonderful scene here between Mirage and Syndrome, and it touches on the, the kind of the creepy side of Syndrome. Next time you gamble, bet your own life. This sequence uh, has Helen going back to her Elastigirl mode, and I was always really intrigued with this idea of someone who had embraced motherhood really having to call on some old skills and being great at it. Mark Andrews and I uh, collaborated with each other on figuring out all these ways she could get caught. And uh, he ended up boarding the entire sequence and did a fantastic job. I mean, it, it is what you see now, only in board form. And this is a great shot design that was done by uh, Mark Andrews and Andy Jimenez. A uh, beautiful piece of animation here uh, by Dave Mullins of her. Uh, and then right here, Rob Russ did this. Where and she flattens up. Yeah. That's so amazing. Her hair stays out. It's just great. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, very difficult to switch Helen around into the model that can do all the stretchy things and keep it seamless. 
but I love all the sets and this stuff, the size of this stuff. Oh, this gag was in my original <laughs> pitch. That was part of my original pitch was, you know, I always see women being hypercritical of their own bodies. And, you know, m most men are just, hey, you look great. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're a woman, you know? So I see that as, you know, I had three sisters and I just see that women are, are way too critical of their own bodies. Men are just grateful that they're around. <laughs> That's right. uh, trust me, yeah. this whole sequence of her... Uh, stretching actually becoming kind of a problem was something that Mark Andrews and I worked out and uh, uh, the first stuff of her being in the base a uh, storyboard artist did it and it was very plain and I said no you don't understand this this stretching has got to be a problem you know but what if she gets caught between doors and, and so at that point Mark and I just grabbed it and this uh, is very much the way Mark boarded it some of my fondest memories on this film is sitting down with Mark and figuring out how many ways she could get uh, get screwed up, <laughs> get screwed up, and it's wonderful animation by Sean Krause in there of her getting all trapped. Here's Violet practicing, you know, this is not going to happen again, what happened on right. the plane. Yeah, I wanted to yeah. show that she was obsessed about not failing now. And so it's really kind of a character change for her. What? Wonderful lighting in this section uh, by Janet Lucroy and company. And wonderful animation by Dave Devan. And it's great that Violet's got her hair behind both her ears. She's ready for action now. Yeah, that was the visual idea there and why having her hair work was such an issue. As a filmmaker, you're always looking for ways to say things visually. And having her hair start out in front of her face like something she's hiding behind and then gradually get pushed back and even having mom push it back in the Cameron Miyazaki scenes was key to showing what's going on with her. I really believe in giving young talent a chance. If, if you believe in the talent, you don't have to, to baby step everybody. In my first animation job, I had the misfortune of um, working under a director who really underestimated a lot of people and constantly was hobbling them with low expectations and very pa patronizingly telling people, you know, you're not ready for this and you're not ready for that. And I think that it really put a fire in me that once I got to be a director that I would be exactly the opposite and I would um, give people, talented people who were inexperienced, challenging scenes. It's become a personal cause of mine to take inexperienced animators and throw them in the deep end and see if they can swim. And this film was no exception. I uh, gave some very challenging scenes to some very inexperienced animators who were just happened to be very talented. And it scared the bejesus out of them, but um, they went for it and they completely delivered. And I've only been disappointed, you know, maybe a couple of times in, uh, and I've done this a lot of times. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, almost every time, the people deliver in spades. And I think that uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing for experienced animators to see too, is that you know the game is on and, and there's some great people coming up and I'm gonna give them their shot. And if they deliver, then you know, sky's the limit. And we did it all through the film and, and the production side as well. I mean, the people rise to the occasion, especially people at Pixar, which is, you know, they're just a, a huge group of overachievers and they're just waiting to go. Yeah, uh, the resources here are phenomenal. There, that one. Voice key incorrect. Voice key. Voice key incorrect. Wait a the bird being a sentry was Mike Cachuela's idea, who worked on the story early on. And uh, I thought it was a great idea. Alert. 
this scene right here was a real challenge to write. I wrote it like four different ways. And the goal was how do you, how do you justify Mirage letting this guy go? And how would he react after he's had time to think about it? Um, there was some disagreement whether or not he would uh, threaten her at this point, but I felt like he had been stewing in his own juices here and that he would truly be not knowing whether he was going to choke her or not. You know, he had lost everything. Right. The goal was to get to this point. <laughs> <laughs> For the where, gag. <laughs> yeah. Uh, There's great animation here by Andy Schmidt, uh, <laughs> which is one of the great falls <laughs> of all time. And, but that was uh, always a big issue. Why does, you know, the mirage turn? Why does she turn? Why does she, what, what is right. it? How are you going to set that up? And, yeah. and it fell into place when, you know, the idea of mirage pushing Syndrome out of the way and then, yeah. and then having him risk her life, her life after yeah. that. It which was showing the blatant disregard Syndrome has for life. And I feel like a lot of our villains in real life have for life. Yeah. Oftentimes it's decorated as a higher calling, but it isn't. You think they're supers? Yes, remember what Mom said. Hmm. Hey, stop talking. Hold it, freeze. Dash, run. What? Run. Oh, yeah. What the? They're supers. Get the boy. Show yourself. Now we're into the full-on, a sequence we call the 100-mile dash. And this was something that I pitched in my first pitch. And unlike some sequences where I kind of had the bones figured out, but I wanted to flesh them out with the, the board guys, like the last sequence uh, in the city, um, this one I was ultra-specific with. And I wrote every single thing in here because this was one of the reasons I wanted to do this movie. This was like, if, if the movie were a meal, this is the, uh, this is the cobbler afterwards, <laughs> you know, or, or whatever. But uh, uh, this was one of the things that I just desperately wanted to see as a movie goer. I wanted to see what would happen if you could run, and that's your only power. But uh, that in itself is a tremendous gift if very fast people are trying to kill you. So, <laughs> and and what's so great about the sequence is he he discovers through it, you know, what he can do. Right. That's he doesn't the, know what he can do. That's the point of the yeah. sequence. Yeah. Is is that it's not just a chase sequence. It's uh, a kid discovering that he can do a lot more than he thought he could do. Again, this was another one of those things where in the f the first version that was boarded, uh, it was kind of just boarded straight action sequence, and all the moments where he has revelations about, hey, I can do this, uh, were taken out. And, and I had to say, you know, hey, no, man, this is the... He just punched a guy in the face and got away with it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> this whole sequence goes between terror and exhilaration because he's absolutely afraid for his life and full of adrenaline, but he's also just marvels at what he himself can do. So it's, it's uh, he's constantly going back and forth between, ah, oh, man, and I just, I, this, I love doing this kind of stuff. Um, uh, Ted Mathot, with, uh, working with Mark Andrews, boarded this beautifully. Andy Jimenez did great shot planning. Patrick uh, really brought it home. The effects are great. Um, Michael's just kicked down the door on the music cue. Yeah. And um, this was one of the, the most fun things in a movie full of fun things. And the idea was having the sequence where he's basically screwed until the last second, and then the fact that he stops actually saves, saves him. him. Yeah. yeah. I think that you can get a grasp of the number of different locations. I hope we had. you can get a grasp of the number of locations <laughs> because Lord knows at the beginning we wouldn't let anybody count. It was like, there are a lot of sets in this movie. Yeah. We should count those up and figure out how we're going to do no, it. No, <laughs> just put down no, a let's, large let's number of sets. Let's just put down a large number right now. I don't think we want to look too closely at this. <laughs> You're afraid everybody is just going to run. I knew they would run. <laughs>
let's say, I, we don't want to do that. Some of these scenes are in flux. Uh, yeah, we yeah, might, yeah, we're we, changing we're our We're changing. Notions. There may not be this many sequences. Yeah. We'll probably cut a lot of the movies long. So let, we'll, we don't, we'll probably, we'll probably, let's not do too close an analysis here. Yeah, we'll probably lose some ambition. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> You start to see the, 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 it's the bickering and sister is, is working stopped. together. And, and, yeah. and it's now they're defending each other. Right. And yeah. they don't, she's never done this before. She's figured, oh my gosh. Well, and yeah. because she put the force field on while she was in the middle of the air and not, you know, touching the ground, she finds that a oh, strange byproduct of that is that she is suspended in this thing yeah. and that she's hit some kind of weird anti gravity moment. And then, <laughs> again, mundane and fantastic. You know, what if you ran into mom and dad here? And <laughs> So it was kind of an entertaining way to get them back together. And uh, he, uh, here the, their moment of togetherness is, is interrupted. And this is the first time that the kids have really seen mom and dad just, you know... Do what they do. Do what yeah. they do. And this is... Uh, you know this kind of feeling where you are surprised by your parents. You know you're not used to seeing them as young people that uh, are physical, and and now the family sort of makes it stand for the first time as a unit. And the idea was to give the audience just a taste of this, and then stop it, shut it <laughs> whoa, down whoa. Be right before <laughs> they get to really watch it. Yeah, matching uniforms. So syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, he's not put this together. You know, he's just realized that he's got a whole bunch of them here. And it delights both the evil guy and the geek in him. Right. You know? <laughs> it's like he's just got four great trading cards, you know? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> huh? Huh? Oh, come on! You gotta admit, this is cool! Just like a movie! The robot really murdered. Um, some wonderful John Carr's animation there, and then Rodrigo did this stuff. Uh, again, I, I'm picking out certain animators because I just happened to mention their scenes, but the entire crew really delivered on this stuff. And uh, Mark Henn and all his team uh, did magnificent simulation. Look at how the cape moves and the hair. Syndrome's hair. Yeah. It's fantastic stuff. And uh, I love the way this room is lit. It's got this really creepy lighting, uh, sort of technical, gleaming feeling, too. It's got yeah. that shiny technology feel. It's cool looking, too. Yeah. yeah. No one will be. <laughs> this is a funny bit of animation that Victor Navone did based on Steve, Steve Hunter's Hunter, walk. <laughs> You know, who's a, a, one of our animation supervisors, and he totally nailed Steve Hunter's walk and the little shake that Steve Hunter sometimes does to kind of loosen up his neck. And uh, <laughs> a lot of these great little physical things are things that people are pulling from their own lives. People think animators film the people doing the voices and just mimic their movements. And although we do run a camera during our recording sessions, it's only one component and the animator may look at it or not. I think if there's a problem in animation, it's that too many animators study only other animation. And I, I was trained to look elsewhere. If your job is to do a kid, then you go to an elementary school or, or the playground or someplace where kids are and, and make your own observations or think about your little brother or somebody that you know. The best animators end up drawing from their lives and they use a little bit of this, a little bit of that. They, they look in the mirror and, and make an expression that they're trying to capture. It frustrates me when people think of animators as technicians because they're artists. And when they pull off a great moment, they're doing something artistic. They combine in a really unique way all the skills and artistry of an actor and a visual artist. Right. That's why there are very few people in the world that can do it at well. the level that we require it at places like Pixar. Right. The even bad guys get to screw around a little bit and, and you know, <laughs> not for long. Enjoy their success, but if they enjoy it too early, yeah, we yep. gotta shut them down. This is the right hanger, but I don't see any jets. A jet's not fast enough. Well, what's faster than a jet? Hey, how about a rocket? 
You know, the one thing I was thinking is I've been watching a lot of commentaries lately, and the ones that I've been watching are are uh, done by people who've seen what their films have done out in the big world, and we're we're just this is before we've released the film, and we're we're, we're we, we, we like, like it, it. <laughs> but we, we, we have, have no, no idea, idea if the the uh, the Pixar string of success is. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, are we going to be the ones that break it? You know, it's like, oh, please no. You know, that, that'll little... teach him to let in these outside guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, no, uh, we we had a blast making it, and it's absolutely the film that I wanted to make. Um, uh, Mike Venturini did this animation of uh, Frozone here that I just love. And uh, Sam Jackson really did a funny performance here, a great performance, I think. I, I love Sam Jackson. <laughs> uh, um, but, uh, yeah, so uh, we have no idea how this will be received. Um, we're, we're hoping for it. We certainly couldn't have tried any harder than we tried. No. We absolutely killed ourselves on this. So we hope everybody likes it. <laughs> yeah, we're going to get... <laughs> This is uh, another fantastic musical cue, and Michael kind of does a heroic version of the villain theme, which I think is really great, because that is what Syndrome is at this moment. And the fact that he's enjoying being a superhero and endangering people. Well, at the same time, <laughs> he saves a bunch of people, then he throws this tanker sort of yeah. mindlessly behind him. Yeah, it. kind of forgetting the fact that there's people <laughs> around. Yeah. Uh, which is the great schizophrenia of the character, the obliviousness of the character. Coming up is one of the most inspired ideas, I think, in the, in the film. But yeah. <laughs> um, I knew I had to get the family back to the city, and I always had that stuff in there. But one of the, we, I didn't know quite how to get them back in the city, and we talked about a lot of things, and one of our storyboard artists who, uh, who I worked with on The Simpsons and Iron Giant as well, a great uh, guy, uh, Kevin O'Brien, uh, said, hey, let me try something. I, I, got, I got an idea. Let me try something. And he pitched this idea of them suspending a van you know, with Helen holding it on. And it was so off the wall. At first I went, let me think about this. This is so weird. And and I took a couple of hours and I just went, how can it not be this? It's such a weird idea and so great. Um, a Winnebago yeah. strapped to a yeah. rocket landing right, in the landing. city. Yeah. Okay. So, so um, one of my challenges as a director is I'm always trying to keep things efficient because I, I appreciate the, the fact that a lot of money and resources are going to me. And so I very quickly wanted to get them landed and resolved. And again, another fine moment for our executive producer, John Lasseter. John said, wait a minute, we need something. We need a comedy here. Maybe they should have an argument. And I latched on it and immediately said, don't say another word. I know exactly what to do. Because, again, when John says it, you are given permission. So I was not being the irresponsible director. You know, he was, he created a little opening for me there. And I think the idea of having Bob and Helen argue over directions was great. And I wrote that scene, and I think that it's the perfect thing to have there. Super duper, Dad! Let's <laughs> do that again. <laughs> Wait here and stay hidden. I'm going in. While what? I watch helplessly from the sidelines? I don't think so. I'm asking you to wait with the kids. And I'm telling you, not a chance. You're my husband, I'm with you. For better or worse. I have to do this alone. What is this to you, Plato? This scene uh, uh, starts out with uh, some wonderful animation by Doug Frankel here. And right at a key point here, uh, this is some of the most important dramatic animation in the film. It switches to Pete's own uh, right here. And uh, this is incredibly hard stuff to do to make it seem sincere and real. And the idea is that he's exposing, Bob is exposing uh, where he feels weak. And it's so unexpected to Helen that she's incredibly touched by it. And... Uh, this sweet moment, of course, is interrupted by <laughs> a giant robot. <laughs> of course. Of course. It's the incredible. What else? Yeah. Uh, so uh, now we're full on to this sequence, and this is the kind of sequence that I write loosely. I write 
what needs to happen. We need to see Violet get knocked out. We need to see Dad come to the rescue because Dad has been the negligent guy up to this point. We need to see him defend his kids. I had a few of these things laid out, the things that we must do. We must see this. We must have each character have their uh, moment. But beyond those parameters, I just had in, you know, it's a big action scene. All the characters and Frozone are involved. Um, and it went through, uh, you know, uh, uh, how many different... A million iterations. And, and it wasn't until near the very end that it solidified. Well, yeah, yeah we got this idea, uh, Mark and I, of the, the remote being a thing. And that's what we needed was the mundane. We right. had all these fantastic versions of the end sequence, but it didn't feel like the movie because it was only fantastic. Right. And once we got this idea of them fighting over the remote, which is something that everybody <laughs> everybody relates to, I yeah. think, then that was all that we needed. All the previous versions were useful because we knew what we didn't want to do. But um, there were elements, you know, we, we wanted to reprise him running on water and we wanted to show that throwing the ball thing had a place and right. stuff like that. Uh, but um, really this end thing was, again, a uh, collaboration between our fabulous uh, Mark Andrews and uh, uh, and uh, I think it turned out terrific right um, and you don't you know you know where you are you know, you're not getting lost but you're moving all over the place right. it's just great right those are the kind of things I love as a director because I find them challenging when, when you have a lot of information to get across in a short period of time um, I am very actively involved in, in shot planning it's it's I really love it and I um, uh, when I'm writing things I imagine shots so I am very active in the storyboarding part it's not something that is just sort of sent to me um, and I take pleasure out of working stuff like this out because I find it uh, it's very easy to lose the audience in in this kind of stuff and there are a lot of action movies that aren't very well done, that are confusing, where you just see a bunch of close-ups and you don't know if somebody's 10 feet from somebody or 100. And the great action directors, you know, James Cameron and Spielberg and George Miller and those guys, always you always know where you are every second. And um, that's the kind of sequence that I wanted to see on screen. The robot! People ask me what an animation director does, and it frustrates me because most of the important job a director does in animation is exactly the same as a director in live action. Do we understand the characters? Are their motivations believable? Do we feel something? Can we follow the plot? Is anything dragging? Do we clearly understand the, the spatial relationships when, when they're important? Um, what is the timing of an edit? What is the composition of shots? Um, what is the, when does music come into play? What kind of music is n necessary here? All of these questions are exactly the same that any other filmmaker faces. And there seems to be a feeling that animated films just sort of happen. That there's some technician somewhere that just move things around and yeah, you know, press pr buttons. Yeah, and press a, the button that says make movie. And, and it's so not that way. These things take a tremendous amount of thought. But for me, the bottom line is storytelling is storytelling. Right. And you either engage people or you don't. And you either get them to feel something, whether it be feeling scared or, or laughing at something or feeling sad, or you don't. You kill him dead. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and uh, here is an absolutely fantastic piece of effects work. Uh, and this is Martin Wing again, and, and uh, Explosion Sim done by Gary Bruins. Uh, it's, it's really spectacular. <laughs> so our heroes have saved the day. Our villain is gone and Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson make an appearance make an appearance and as we record this uh, Frank uh, passed away last night at the age of 92 leaving behind an unbelievable amount of great work and uh, he was one of my mentors and he and Ollie and Eric Larson and Milt Call and all those Disney guys I just uh, anyone in the field of feature animation owes them a huge debt of gratitude. It's just an amazing body of work and 
Here's to you, Frank. They also made an appearance. Appeared in Iron Giant. In yeah. Iron Giant, and I was really happy to get them both in, in this movie because I'm such an admirer of both their work and all of those guys. Any chance I get to tip my hat to those guys, I do. And here's a great performance by uh, Spencer Fox. Oh, yeah, really yeah. Really great yeah. readings of these yeah. lines. And, and Ron Zorman did yeah, that animation. animation just really, really terrific. Yeah, Spencer had very quirky line readings that were they were one of a kind and, and and very quickly it became obvious that he was our guy. Those guys that tried to kill us! That was the best vacation ever! I love our family. You know, I've gone this whole time without mentioning our animation supervisors, the three caballeros, uh, Tony Fuccelli, Steve Hunter, and Alan Barilero, and they have done an awesome job. And the thing is, is they're everywhere. There's no specific scene that they right. animated, but they're all over the movie. They just lift everyone else's work up. It's really uh, yeah. quite remarkable. Thank you, caballeros. You bet. Ah! Yeah. The baby's sleeping. Here's a fantastic bit of animation from John Cars. You took away my future. And the idea that he's now violating the home, which is more connected to the original uh, uh, opening that we did with Syndrome, right. which is also on this DVD, kind of violating the home. The opening, the old opening scene in the movie was him coming in to grab the baby. Right. And now it's um, the last. Well, and this was always a part of my original pitch. And it, it, you know, I didn't have that scene in the city uh, <laughs> worked out, but I, I knew I wanted this scene. And part of the problem with a lot of um, the superhero movies for me is that they're always involving huge throngs of people at the end because you want it to be spectacular. But it's hard for the audience to care about a throng. Right. You know, they can care about a person though so I always knew that I wanted to have the last action sequence in the movie be around the baby because we care about the baby right and of course mom and dad don't know in this whole section that Jack right. Jack has done all that transforming up there right they still think he's just, just Jack Jack just Jack Jack and he had one more yeah he, he was going to go he turned through. gooey and we, turn gooey, we couldn't get it to work quite get it time. right yeah so here Syndrome is done in by what? His cape! <laughs> no capes! <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I really like this shot where Mom is trying to reassure her kid while <laughs> debris is raining down on her. And this shot to me is also emblematic of the movie. You have suburbia, but one house is detonating. <laughs> no sequence left unexploded. Slogan copyright John Walker 2000. Again, this uh, Sandy Cartman and uh, Mock Kobayashi did a great job on that force field, which I think is a, a beautiful effect. <laughs> Here's a little guest appearance by my son Nick, uh, who was also the voice of Squirt in Finding Nemo. And here we have the track meet, which uh, is something that was. Uh, in the early pitch, and uh, Tony Reidinger making his reappearance, and Violet's uh, hair is back, and she's um, feeling very different about herself. And she's at one point, one version of this, you had uh, Violet kissing him. Yeah, she was yeah. getting she's a little, little too forward there. A little forward there. Little we forward there. <laughs> <laughs> I thought maybe she wouldn't do that. Yeah. but she was. I was like, well, she is a superhero. Yeah, you know, she's she's uh, not too scared of Tony anymore. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? My oldest boy, Michael, does the voice for Tony Reidinger there, and my middle boy, Jack, was the inspiration for Jack-Jack, so nepotism is alive and well on The Incredibles, and, uh, and I feel like I'm leaving out my wife here. She has amazing superpowers, which were the inspiration for this film. No! Pull back! Pull back! Slow down just a little bit! Don't give up! This is them clicking back into fitting in mode, and, you know, it's much easier. Yeah. yeah. Holly and Craig did a, uh, Sarah did a, a wonderful job in that. I mean, you have to listen for them, but they're uh, doing really funny stuff in there. You know, uh, there's a Pixar tradition, which I originally didn't want to observe, of having John Ratzenberger in there. I thought, why, you know, 
I thought, why do, does every movie have to have it? And then I thought, geez, every movie has been successful. <laughs> this is not really a tradition I want to break. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then I thought, hey, he's perfect for the underminer. And he did a great job as right. the underminer. Right. So he's kind of the, the joke here is that he's the last voice in the movie. <laughs> sequence that was uh, designed by Teddy Newton. Andy uh, Jimenez. Andy and Jimenez, yeah, did Mark a lot Holmes. of the, Mark Holmes and uh, Lou Romano did a lot of the color. The idea was to stay with our retro 60s yeah. thing. In the early, late 50s and early 60s, movies used to have these really elaborate, great graphic, you know, yeah. uh, title sequences done by. Uh, you know, guys like uh, Saul Bass and uh, Maurice Bender, and uh, I thought it would be a great way to send people out is to have one of these very graphic end title sequences that remind people of things in the movie, and and um, I think it's also a nice way to frame all these wonderful people who did such a fantastic job on the film. And, you know, one of the hardest things about doing commentaries is that for every person you can mention, there are... 10 or 15 that you're not mentioning who also did incredible work and you're seeing all their names right now. You know, hundreds of people worked on the film and, and it's been a, just a joyous experience. I mean, Pixar is an amazing place to, to make movies and, and the caliber of the, the talent here is you know, just off the charts. We were just blessed to, to be able to come and, and uh, work with these people. Coming up here was like walking into Yankee Stadium. This is the place where they hit nothing but home runs. This is the place that is the top of the heap for animation studios, movie studios. And to walk into that, it was challenging. <laughs> you know, I was like, what are, what are we going to do up here that hasn't been done before? And yet you can't walk into a place like this and act scared. You know, nobody wants shrinking violet directors and producers. They want people that are going to come in and take over, eh? you know, do what they do, a add to the party, make it better. So we turned up the bravado pretty loud in those first few months to make sure that, you know, we made an impression. I don't know if it was always a good impression, but by God, we were going to make an impression. We weren't going to act scared. And frankly, I was scared. It's so great to work at a, a company where it's the only thing that you, you have you know, to worry they, about, about is, is the being movie. great. It's got to be great. Make yeah. it great. Make it great. Make it great. You know, you're really challenged by that, and it's and you've got the wherewithal to do it. The, yeah, and they support here. you every step of the way. And and um, speaking generally, a lot of movie making is shielding the movie from all the forces <laughs> of you know trying to hurt it. And uh, here is just this incredibly uh, protective place. Stories are protected. At the same time, they're challenged and nurtured and, you know, given all their vitamins and iron and good night's <laughs> sleep. And, and uh, it's just... Uh, you might not get a good night's sleep, I but might the not, movie does. But the movie does, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, in fact, I'm just trying to catch up on some sleep now. But anyway, one of the things that startled me about the CG process is it seemed like we were just making decisions for years complicated tiny nuanced ultra detailed decisions about unbelievably wide variety of stuff and all these decisions were just going into this bottomless black pit and it's like one of those pits wh where you drop something and you never hear it hitting anything it's just each day you would chuck another thousand decisions into this pit and you wouldn't see the film ever seem to move forward. And every once in a while I'd go, this movie is getting made, right? I mean, we are going to complete it. These decisions, there, yes, yes, we've got the decisions. They've, they've successfully landed at the bottom of the pit. It took several days for it to actually reach the bottom of the pit. But they're there, and we've got them, and they're cataloged, and uh, duly noted. Pretty soon I'd forget about them, and it would just seem like I was going to be on this film my entire life. Uh, just, you know, as long as I give them a thousand decisions to throw into the pit, you know, everything will move forward. Well, the funny thing is, is by the time I started forgetting about it, 
the film would start coming back and it would be complete, you know, and all these things actually did go somewhere. And it was almost like, yeah, when did this get done? That's the thousand, you know, 400 billion decisions. That's what they look like all together. So uh, it was, it, it seemed like nothing happened. And then it seemed like overnight, everything happened and the film suddenly appeared. Uh, we are incredibly grateful to all these the people that you see here. Please look at some of the other features on the DVD where all these people are, are singled out and highlighted because, right. uh, you know, uh, Bill Wise and... and uh, Rick Sayre. Rick Sayre and Brynn McGeary and Ralph Eggleston came in off of... Uh, just coming off of Nemo when we were in deep trouble and really saved our hide. And Nigel and, and, and uh, just... Janet and Patrick and, and that, uh, over, <laughs> and, and, over, over and, and over and over and over and over and over again. Corey Ray, and Corey so Ray, uh, Catherine, Catherine Serafian, Serafian, Mark Hen, you know, leading simulation, all those great guys in sim. We can't forget our esteemed editor, Steve Schaefer. Steve Schaefer, he's right on the other side of the glass, staring at us, going, staring at us. Hey, hey, <laughs> what about me? What about me? I was only <laughs> on it for the whole ride. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway. It's a collection of, of brilliant people really trying their absolute hardest. And uh, John and I are incredibly grateful to every single name you see here, even the production babies. We're grateful to you, production <laughs> for babies. babies. For being born. <laughs> for being born during this film. <laughs> and, and giving your parents another reason to go back to work. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, you know, there is actually uh, one of our animators, Dave Mullins, uh, was overthinking uh, some of his first scenes on the film. Huh? And the minute he had his kid, because there was suddenly this huge demand on his energy, he had to focus down his scenes. And his scenes became three times more, you know, right on the money yeah. because he had limited energy <laughs> and he had to focus all of it. Uh, you know, correct. he couldn't he couldn't overthink anything. And it, it actually, so thank you, Mullins production baby. <laughs> For focusing your father. <laughs> yeah. No, really. Every single name you see here is, is uh, uh, just, uh, um, we thank you. Yeah. And we thank you, Valley.